Welcome to Lessons in Leadership. I'm Steve Adubato with the talented Mary Gamba, my co-host and executive producer. We're kicking off a brand new initiative today. Um, if you don't see him right now on your screen, I believe, Elvin, you're going to see him in a second. Do we see Roger? We see Roger DeRose, who's the president and CEO of Kessler Foundation. Roger, do you mind if I actually set this up as to what we're doing? Do you mind? Not, not at all. Not at all. You want me to start? No, I got this. Oh, you got, I got this. this. Okay. Roger's a take charge guy. Okay. But here's the deal. Um, with Together with the with Kessler Foundation, who have come on board as sponsors of Lessons in Leadership, listen, a lot of people, the logos, the branding, that's all great. But with Kessler Foundation, we're starting off a series of interviews, segments around research, science, innovation, and, of course, leadership. Roger's going to describe exactly what Kessler Foundation is about. We'll be putting up their website so people can find out more so you can contribute to the research they're doing. All about research, science, innovation, and leadership. Mary, before we get into Roger, can we please plug the other great sponsors of Lessons in Leadership? I would love to. So we have the NJ Sharing Network. If you're not an organ and tissue donor, please go onto their website. It'll be on screen so you can learn more about that. Seton Hall University and the Bassino Leadership Institute, the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825. And we also have a sponsors, Valley Bank and Prager Metis. So uh, we're in really great company, Roger, with you at Kessler Foundation. We're excited to have you on board. And finally, Delta Dental of New Jersey. And we always smile when we say that for healthy teeth. <laughs> yes, there are new sponsors as well. And by the way, Delta Dental is sponsoring a series on small business leadership. Roger, put this in context. Why did you? with limited resources, as every organization does, why did you say, yes, we want to do a series on research, innovation, science, and leadership? And by the way, then we'll set up the kinds of people who will be joining us from Kessler Foundation on the series. Why is that so important as we put up the website for the foundation? Thanks, Steve, and thank you, Mary. It, it's great to be with, uh, with you and, and your viewers today. And uh, we, we thank you for the opportunity, Steve and Mary, to be with you and talk about Kessler Foundation and the research that we're doing. I think it's important, Steve, because, you know, we're all about uh, human translation research. And by that, I mean, we're not dealing with animal research. We're dealing with humans. And we do everything that we can to move that research into patient care and to create it as the standard of the next generation of care for patients in spinal cord injury and brain injury and stroke, multiple sclerosis and several other neuromuscular type conditions. So I think this is a great opportunity for us to talk to your viewers, hopefully interest some of them into donating to our work. And I'll tell you a little bit more about sure. why I think they, they can leverage their dollars by investing in our work. But uh, this gives us a great opportunity to talk to your viewers, the brain trust of the leadership series of the Steve Adubato program. And by the way, plug Michelle, who will be joining us, who leads the development effort at the foundation. She'll be joining us. Tell everyone who Michelle is. Yeah, Michelle Pignatello is our, our vice president and chief development officer. And she has joined us. She joined us about seven years ago. And uh, she has just been a, 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 a fire breather, uh, really just a fire brand in terms of creating- Glad you corrected that, Roger. Uh, well, in terms of, <laughs> and, and what I mean by that is- that she, she gets stuff a, done. She's a powerhouse. She's all about action, 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 and getting things done. And this year, she's just having a, a fantastic year, six months into our fiscal year, Steve. So, you know, she's bringing donors in to, to create a record year for the foundation. And by the way, when Michelle joins us, one of the things we're going to be talking about is not just where those dollars go, but also the connection, and Mary and I talk about this all the time, between fundraising and leadership. Right. You better be a great leader to raise money, to bring it in, to keep funders not only happy, but believing that their investment is going to something important. Those are important communication and leadership skills. Mary, jump in, because then I want to talk to Roger about the leadership academy that we actually have going at Kessler Foundation right now with some pretty extraordinary leaders. Go ahead, Mary. Sure thing. So Roger, you talked about the donation dollars and where they may go. I think everyone, as you're driving, you'll see Kessler Foundation. I bet in the Kessler, the rehabilitation, you know, there's the types of rehabilitation, but talk about some of the really groundbreaking things um, with spinal cord injuries, things like that. So where specifically will those dollars go? Because we will be profiling many of those people in our future episodes. Thanks, Mary. I appreciate it. That's a great question. Let me first say, Mary, that, um, 
you know, we're unlike a lot of other nonprofits or public charities in that we're fortunate to have an endowment. And because of that, that covers all of our administrative expenses. So when a donor gives us a dollar or $10,000 or a million dollars, every dollar of that, 100% of that dollar goes directly to the research that they're designating. So let me give you an example. So we had a, a donor that we have named the Center for Spinal Stimulation after. And he's been a very, very, he and his wife have been very generous donors to the organization. Name them, Roger. And the name is uh, Tim and Caroline Reynolds. Uh, They're extraordinary very people. Generous, extraordinary people yep. here from New Jersey. And um, Tim is very interested in the, the work that we've been doing and his wife, Caroline, and the work that we've been doing in terms of spinal stimulation, working with patients, spinal cord patients. And the great thing about this, uh, this technology, this research, the science that we're doing is that um, uh, we can connect brain intention with the healthy neurons below the level of the spinal cord injury, the healthy neurons that are still living, that are still active in the spinal cord. So that when the brain says, you know, move your foot, move your toe, move your knee, stand, that the body actually responds to the brain command. Now, without that stimulation, and there are very specific algorithms that take place uh, that we've been working on for years now, um, when without that stimulation, it doesn't occur. It's just a thought that doesn't connect to the remainder, the rest of the, uh, of the healthy neurons. But with the stimulation, it's so exciting. It's, um, it, it's the next generation, it's the next leap forward in terms of how we're gonna be treating spinal cord patients in the future. And it doesn't end there either, Steve and Mary, because we'll be able to use this technology and these procedures and treatments and interventions on other individuals that have mobility issues as well. Let, let me follow up on this. You know, we happen also to disclose, we're in the midst as we speak right now in the summer of 2021, conducting a series of seminars. It, it's the Kessler, Foundation Stand and Deliver Leadership Academy. And there are, I believe 10 or so, Mary, 10 or 11, yep. incredibly talented researchers, scientists, PhDs that are just really smart. Do you believe, Roger, even though they have gone into science and research to make a difference in the lives of others who are dealing with spinal cord injuries and the whole range of areas where Kessler Foundation um, does research, do you believe at the core they see themselves as quote unquote leaders? That's a great question, Steve. You know, you know I, I would tell you this, that first and foremost from, from what I see of, and I know who those, those leaders are that have been through your program now for the last four years, Steve, on our campus. First of all, I, I think they're so enthusiastic about the mission. You know, they, they can see the North Star. Of the Star, foundation. Right, the foundation's mission, right. right. They can see the North Star in terms of the work that we do. And, and then on top of that, they're great at science, right? So we're hiring some of the, the world-class scientists that can compete on the NIH stage, on the Department of Defense stage, on all the federal agency stages for grant wins and grant making. So they're great at science. But they're, they're also, uh, you know, from a leadership point of view, they're, they have to be great grant writers, they have to be great publishers, because publishing is so important in order to get grants, new grants, as the peer review panels review the work that they've done. But they also have to be, as leaders, great at communications. And, you know, this is something that you've been spending so much time with them. And we see the results, Steve. You know, in addition to that, they've got to be great at project management. They've got to be great at relationship building with people. Hold on, Roger. Roger, yeah. sorry for interrupting. Great at communication, presenting, yeah. executive presence, talking to non-scientific audiences, running meetings. How about developing and coaching other people and mentoring them, which is not so, in their wheelhouse naturally. Go ahead, Roger, pick it up. So important, Steve. You know, they have to be mentors to the next generation of scientists and leaders that are coming up in the organization. Because when you think about science, you know, you're really building on the shoulders of scientists that have come before you. And so if you're not building those scientists, if you're not mentoring them, you're not, you're not 
creating the future generation of leaders at our foundation. And we've got such a great, great track uh, record in terms of retention of our leadership employees. And I think that makes all the difference in terms of not having that turnstile on the front door where people are coming and going. The people that you've been training over the last four they years, stay. They're, there. they're with us, they're with us. They believe in the mission. And yeah. you know, the other thing too, Steve, I would tell you is that um, they are strong collaborators. They're not siloed in any way. And that's so important because we work across all of the different centers to leverage the strengths of the organization. And the most important area I would tell you, Steve, is being uh, having the confidence in their work when they get up and they present to the board, when they present to their peers, when they present to others in the organization, to management, their ideas that they can sell them. That's and right. You, you think about selling uh, as a scientist and it, it's not high on your list but it's one of the most important aspects. It sure is. Mary, last question for Roger on your end. Yeah, no, and it's more even of a, a, a statement first and foremost. I mean, I'm just in awe of the work that you do and we will be putting up a QR code. So if you're watching now and you would like to donate- What to is it, oh, oh, what Mary? I know oh, it's what? something new. It's those little barcodes, you know, when you go to a restaurant and they say you scan it with your phone and it takes you right to where it needs to go. You can do that on television as well. So we're going to put that up so people could just scan it. And if you're old school, you can go to the website and, and just make a donation. And you talked a little bit about culture, Roger. How, how did it over the last 18 plus months with the pandemic, how did that work when you're doing, many of us were able to work from home. Um, how did that work with everyone still having to come in and because you truly are saving and changing lives? Well, it's a great question as well, Mary. And um, it, it was a, a difficult time, obviously. You know, when we hit that, that mid-March 2020 uh, critical stage, we did close down for three months at the research center. We closed it down. The hospital stayed open. Kessler Institute stayed open, which is a great partner of ours because we have such a, a great working relationship with them. And our footprint, our research footprint is on their campus. But we did close down for three months and it really did have an impact on the organization. But you know, uh, we came back in the middle of June and uh, in spite of the pandemic, we took every precaution that you can imagine, pumping hundreds of thousands of dollars into protective equipment for our employees, for the patient, yep. et cetera. And um, by bringing them back as critical infrastructure employees, it really put them at the front line in terms of being the first to get vaccinated when the vaccinations came out and the, vaccin the, uh, the vaccinations came right to the campus. So we were able to get them vaccinated and make them uh, give them a, another bubble of safety in terms of the work that they do. But I would tell you this, Mary, that by opening last June of 2020, I think it positioned us for not only having a great 2020 for the remainder of that very, very challenging and difficult year, but it set us up for an outstanding 2021. And we're only six months into it, but it's gonna be a record year yeah. in terms of grants and also in terms of fundraising. And in that spirit, uh, Roger will continue to join us throughout this series on research, science, innovation, and leadership that's made possible through Kessler Foundation. A whole range of leaders who are with the foundation will be joining us. Roger will be offering analysis and um, putting things in perspective as well. We'll keep the website up for Kessler Foundation. What is the thing called again, Mary, that people? Oh, it's a QR code. Yeah, we'll be putting that up so they could just scan it with their phone. It takes them right to where it, to where they need to go to make a contribution. Right, Roger and I live next door to each other in Montclair. He goes to a restaurant, he does the barcode. I'm like, listen, give me the old school thing. Yeah. <laughs> give, give me the menu. I'm not looking at that. I'll evolve. I was, next time you're with us, Roger, I'm gonna ask you how you have evolved and grown as a leader. Cause I know when it comes to restaurants and the, and the code, I haven't evolved at all. Uh, Roger DeRose, Mary Gamba, Steve Adubato, Lessons in Leadership. Thank you, my friend, a great partnership. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Mary, appreciate it. Good to be with you. We'll be right back right after this. This edition of Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague, Mary Gamba, has been brought to you by the Bucino Leadership Institute at Seton Hall University, Prager Metis, Valley Bank, the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, the New Jersey Sharing Network, Delta Dental of New Jersey, 
Kessler Foundation, and Seton Hall University, showing the world what great minds can do since 1856. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. That's stand-deliver.com. So here we go, folks. Everything you've ever wanted to know about presidential leadership in history. We've got our good friend Rick Thigpen, uh, Senior Vice President of Corporate Citizenship at PSEG. Now, that's his official title, but his unofficial title is this guy knows history. We actually did a great um, the history drum Blackhead documentary we did. Right. By the way, check out our other website, steveautobato.org. Check out the documentary we did on drum Blackhead, which Rick was a star of because he narrated the whole thing for us. Hey, Rick, before we get into the presidential thing, your fascinated with, fascination with history comes from? I'm a history buff. By love of history, I find it incredibly relevant to understand the present. And I think I know more about myself, my own culture, and our country by learning about history. So let's do this. We're going to go through these presidents. And Mary, I'm praying that in post-production, we could put some pictures in to put it into context. Some of these presidents, I think I know something about. Others, I know nothing about. And, but it's all about leadership. It's not politics. It's not policy. It's leadership. Can we start with this? Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Go ahead. Leader. A tremendous American, a four-term winner of presidential elections, which has never happened before. It hasn't happened since. A man who's arguably uh, responsible for saving American capitalism by his handling of the Great Depression. And a man who obviously led this country through an existential moment called World War II. And he did it all the all the same at the same time, maintaining popularity, maintaining majorities for his own party in the both houses of Congress during his entire tenure. He handled some tremendous crises for America in a fashion where a politician has never been so successful doing it. And to top it off, Steve, he was handicapped. I was just going to say that he had polio, no? He had polio and, and he was unable to walk. So he, he, he lived in a wheelchair. So his leadership vision arguably helps save our country. His New Deal vision uh, really changed politics in America. I think many of us would argue things like the Social Security Act and, this, and the social safety net that was passed during the time of Franklin Delano Roosevelt has changed our country for the better. A man who comes from money and who grew up as a Protestant reformer in politics and thought that a lot of the little people were perhaps not his concern, but he learned and grew and he became a great American and had a tremendous impact on the fate and the future of our country. Hey, Mary, check this one out as we look at uh, some pictures of, of Roosevelt. The other president from New Jersey. Now, he wasn't he was the president of Princeton, but he wasn't, quote, from New Jersey originally. Right. It's Woodrow Wilson, correct? Born in born in Virginia and the only governor of New Jersey to be president of the United States. OK, what made Wilson a special kind of leader? Wilson was a special leader in several regards. He was a reformer, and that's how he made his name as governor of New Jersey. But doing that, he alienated the political bosses who felt that, he, uh, that they put him in office. He became fairly unpopular in New Jersey. He ran for president in two presidential elections. He never got 45% of the vote in New Jersey. He was also a dreamer, an idealist, and he had a bright vision of the future. And that is most aptly, I think, summarized by the Treaty of Versailles, the peace treaty that was that was signed to end World War I, arguably the most important political document of the 20th century. And his dream of the future, he was not able to achieve politically by having it ratified. And that was called the League of Nations. It came about later as the United Nations. But his dream of sort of a multinational cooperative environment, he was anti-colonial, much to his uh, credit in my view. And he was unable to sell it in the world of practical politics. He had a Republican dominated Senate and they refused to ratify his treaty. And his dream, however, is something worth noting. He, he made America leader in the world. He entered the war on behalf of democracy and trying to make the world safe for democracy. 
He also made America a national, a, I'm sorry, an international force. He was a man, like all leaders, who had his flaws, but he had a vision that proved to be quite compelling, even if it didn't get realized for another generation after he left office. You know, as we go through this, Mary, what's so interesting is so much of the presidency and how we view our presidents as leaders have been shaped by the people Rick is talking about. Mary, do you ever think about James Polk? I, before, I was just going to say, before, I had to jump in with that one. We uh, had gotten a list from Rick, and I think no one thinks about James Polk. I said, he was our president? When? How? And, <laughs> and why is he? And now now I have to, I do have to say, I am not a history buff, and I'm very not good at th this topic. However, I am We want to know about Polk as a leader. I want to know about Polk as a leader and why he mattered. He's the winner of the 1844 presidential election, and he beat out uh, Henry. Clay and his running mate was Senator Theodore Freelingheisen from New Jersey. So that was also got a New Jersey angle. James K. Polk is the president of the United States who presided over the greatest territorial expansion of our country to date. He had a vision called Manifest Destiny. He pursued that vision with great uh, vigor. Uh, that vision resulted in things like acquiring the territory of Oregon, the annexation of Texas, and the unfortunate war with Mexico that resulted in acquisition of enormous amounts of territory in the West. But it also set up the contest over whether or not this new territory would be slave or non-slave states mm. that ultimately led to our civil war. So he pursued his vision. He expanded our country greatly. He violated the human rights of lots of people. He treated Mexico unfairly. But can you imagine America without California as part of it? Wow. And he clearly pursued his vision, but he was also arguably the cause of the United States Civil War. He was a protege of Andrew Jackson. That's how he got to be elected president. He's not well known. He was a man who had a vision. He had the drive to achieve his vision. And like all of us, he had his weaknesses. And one of those weaknesses was the impact of his vision on human beings. Hey, you know, Rick, when I talked to you about this yesterday, I said you didn't put uh, Abraham Lincoln on the list. And your response is, come on, everybody talks about Lincoln and leadership. It, it, but is there anything about Lincoln that you think after the movies and the books and half my leadership library on the presidents is, is about Lincoln? Yes, an extraordinary man who rose above his times. And I think there's a very simple quote, with malice towards none, with charity for all. That is not the thing you hear, Steve. You have a little exposure to politicians. You don't hear politicians actually talk and act like that very often. So a man who, after facing four years of existential war for his country, death, and the hatred that came with it, he had the heart to try to bring our country together. He had a vision that did not allow his emotions to take over. And he was a very, very instrumental person in terms of changing the shape of this country. And he's also the first elected Republican president in the history of our country. I, you know, Steve, I want to jump in. I sure. have one question because I'm sure there's a lot of people out there who are not history buffs like me. If there's one book that you could recommend, whether it's written about a president, by a president, or about presidents, plural, is there one go-to book that you could recommend? Steve and I are very huge into creating book lists. If Rich doesn't have one, I have one. I don't have one offhand. I, I, I read a bunch of different books about presidents. I'm not sure I have the signature one. Perhaps Robert Carroll on Lyndon Baines Johnson jumps out at me. Awesome. You know what? That's good because that's a setup for LBJ. But the yes. other one is Doris Kearns Goodwin on uh, presidential leadership. Doris Kearns Goodwin. Mary, let's put it up on our website. I have it in my library because it's about Lincoln, Washington, uh, and LBJ. And I'm forgetting who else. Hey, Lyndon FDR, Johnson. Because, I, because I've got these Kennedy posters all over because when I was a little kid, Jack Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, somehow they connected in my world. And I thought that's public service. But after John F. Kennedy is assassinated on November 22nd, 1963 in Dallas, Texas, and Lyndon Johnson, not elected, becomes president and then wins the presidency in 64 against Barry Goldwater. And then there's the Vietnam War. What else do we need to know about Lyndon Johnson as a leader, Rick Bigpen? Well, Lyndon Johnson, it, it, there's something special about him. And people talk about, you know, power corrupts, but power also reveals a man who grew up in Texas, a man in the 1950s was no friend of civil rights, a man who was able to learn and grow. And by passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, I believe it is, and the Voting Rights Act of 1965, as well as Medicare, 
Lyndon Johnson transformed this country in some meaningful ways, in ways we are still struggling with today. And he's a man who came from a very small background, a man who came up in a world of segregation, a man who grew up in a world that was not about tolerance, and yet he exercised his leadership position and power to spread tolerance in America. And I think it could be said he overcame his background to make America a greater country, an America that is more prepared for its future than it was prior to his arrival on the scene through the very unfortunate circumstances of, of the President Kennedy, our first Catholic president, an incredibly popular man being assassinated. By the way, in, in my book, Mary, and I'm not about to plug this, but in my book, Lessons in Leadership, big section on John F. Kennedy and his leadership during the Cuban Missile Crisis and previous to that, the Bay of Pigs, which did not go well at all. And what he learned as a leader from the debacle of the Bay of Pigs moving into the Cuban Missile Crisis. Hey, Rick, if we can, you did not put him on the list, but and I know that everyone else is gone, but not forgotten. This president, historical for so many reasons, but not so obvious in so many ways. Barack Obama. Yes, sir. Give me a minute. Just give me a minute. A profound man. I, I will quote my dear departed father. Who would have ever thought that the United States would elect Barack Obama as president? I never thought I would see it in my lifetime. That's what Chairman Thickpen said? That. Chairman That's what my father said to me, yes, sir. Bill Thickpen. And I feel the same way. Who would have ever thought that America could have, this country with its past could make that happen? So a man who demonstrated to the world charm, charisma, intelligence, grace, and respect can come in all different colors and all different types of packages. So as a role model and a symbol for my daughter who grew up with Barack Obama and his two African-American children in the White House, the symbol for our country is incredibly powerful. He's also a man who took us one step closer to universal health care, a goal that I think while we fight over it, I doubt if anybody can really object to everybody in the country being taken care of, but he helped bring us closer to that. You know, so a man who broke barriers, who set an example that will be forever followed by others, and you can never say it, it can never happen again, nor can you ever say that someone like that can't do it again. Rick Digpen, a historian, and also, again, senior history vice president. Buff, What's that? History buff. History buff, Steve. History buff, and also a leader at PSEG. Hey, Rick, Rick's going to join us for another segment on non-presidential leaders. Um, they include Henry Ford, Harriet Tubman, Toussaint, Louverture. Louverture, yes. Louverture, sir. and uh, Francis Perkins. Uh, Rick, thank you. Mary, thank you. That's Rick. We're doing more on historical leadership next time on Lessons in Leadership. Thanks, Mary. Thanks, Steve. That is Rick Thigpen. He is a history buff, and he knows a lot about presidential history. Mary, I, I didn't say I was a buff, but I know a lot of this stuff. And I'm just the opposite. I know nothing about history. So I was sitting there in awe. I can't wait to watch this back because I'm, I probably just look like I'm mesmerized by what he's saying, but I am. I was never taught history in a way that was fun informational, uh, really told a story. And the way that Rick told those stories, I'm very interested. That's why I asked about a book. I said, I want to go out and learn more because who unfortunately my, my teachers- Sorry, I got a minute left. Ready? Who was the president who, when they buried him, they had buried him in a bathtub? Oh, I have no idea. He had, well, yeah, he was see, really- he was over, I'm not saying anything, but he was over 300 pounds. I was going to say, he had to be a big guy. I don't know. Yeah. Who knows who it is? Someone, listen, if you know, Go on our website, standdesk.com, but we're going to report it on another thing. I think it was Pat. <laughs> it was a very good I love present. this show. You never know what you're going to see. Yeah, but, uh, oh, Elvin said, say goodbye. I say don't goodbye. know. Nobody the cares. best show ever. Elvin, Steve, Mary, Elvin, Scarlin, Sylvester, the team. Next time, Lessons in Leadership. In a bathtub. <laughs> this edition of Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague, Mary Gamba, has been brought to you by the Bucino Leadership Institute at Seton Hall University, Prager Metis, Valley Bank, the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, the New Jersey Sharing Network, Delta Dental of New Jersey, Kessler Foundation, and Seton Hall University, showing the world what great minds can do since 1856. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. Promotional support for this edition of Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague, Mary Gamba, has been provided by NJ.com, NJBIA, and New Jersey Business Magazine, CIANJ, and Commerce Magazine. <laughs>